Thank you so much, John. I'm a, I'm a bit embarrassed by some of the stuff on my CV. I better revise some of it. Thank you for the opportunity. It indeed is in my honor to give you a presentation today. And uh, I know that you must have heard a number of things that trigger your mind uh, in terms of the deeper knowledge base. What I want to do today is, through a very lighthearted conversation, give an insight into what we anticipate in the next hundred or so years uh, in Africa, South Africa, and the impact that technology will have in terms of shaping this future. So, when I was young, my mother said, Peter, never trust a politician, an economist, or a futurist. And I said, Mom, no, you can trust a, a futurist. You know, they do, think, they do get sometimes the future, we never say how and when it will happen, but uh, it might happen in some obscure way in, in a part of the world. A guy by the William, name of William Gibson said it more succinctly. He said, the future already happened. It's just unequally distributed. In essence, those weak signals we see on the periphery of the economy and in social life, they intend to have a far bigger impact on the future than we anticipate. I'm going to share some of these weak signals with you. Some of the environments of how we can create the future and some futures that will be defined by megatrends. But without further ado, let's take a look at my track record. As, a, as an economist, uh, you sometimes can predict where the, tech, where the economy might hold in the next year or two. Unfortunately, as a futurist, um, my predictions weren't that good. So in 2003, I worked for Vodacom as a strategy consultant and futurist, and we made a number of predictions. What would happen in the next 13 to 15 years? And um, I'll give you a view of some of the technologies we predicted in 2003. We focused heavily on sp speech recognition and said by 2015, you'll be able to talk to your computer and it'll be able to respond. You, you won't really need a screen or a keyboard for your computer. Think of hell in Space Odyssey 2001. And we were quite correct in that regard, that we can talk to our computer and you'll be able to understand it. A little bit later, I'll talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the field that's being funded the most is focusing on speech recognition. So within the next three to four years, we'll see that the primary interface to our phones will start changing to that of voice rather than that of touch. We also made weird predictions that in the future, you'll have two garbage bins. The one garbage bin will be called the replace garbage bin. So you'll fundamentally throw all the stuff in which you want to replace, and that will be automatically be recorded by the retailer and delivered to your door. Uh, and then the throw away garbage bin, you just simply throw away. Well, that was completely wrong. We got that one completely wrong. But Amazon made some interesting changes. They brought these buttons in. And in more than 20 cities in America today, you simply press a button, and within half an hour, that product is delivered, either via drones in Austin, Texas. Um, the moment you press a button, the delivery process starts. Then we believe that in-building navigation will be a massive hit. Now, this is specifically aimed at males in the audience. You know, a male normally would open up his cupboard at home and then say, where the hell is the peanut butter? And then ask his wife after about two minutes, at which point she'll grab it almost immediately, and we would wonder, where the hell did I go wrong on this? So if my wife is mad at me, she sends me to the supermarket, knowing that I'm going to spend about two hours finding the weird things on her list. But technology is there. So very soon you'll be able to walk down the aisles with your shopping list and it'll beep and say, beep, stop, turn left, here's peanut butter. And from the 20 bottles at least you'll be able to grab one. Uh, we were wrong with that one as well, but we anticipate huge changes in the next two years where in-building navigation might come in. We also predicted that you'll be able to buy products directly from your TV set. So as advertisements are disappearing and, in, and TV becoming far more personalized with Showmax and Netflix, you'd be able to take a remote control, click on a product, and they say, oh, that's a nice dress, let me buy it. Not for me, for my wife, but click the button, know what my dimensions or dimensions are, and automatically deliver the dress. And we anticipate this to happen in the next year. So all of you that have Amazon Prime subscriptions, you'll know that the moment you click on any of those TV shows, it, it tells you who the actors are and what song is being played right now. And you can click on the song and purchase it. So it's already available for virtual goods. We believe that Amazon will roll it out as part of their tangible goods as well. We also believe that you would have enhanced reality, putting on a pair of glasses. And if you visit uh, some ruins in Rome, it'll show you what these ruins looked like in the original glory. Well, we got that one kind of wrong as well. Um, and then we believe that there might be memory prosthesis where you'll be able to wear a pair of glasses. 
And by looking at a person, you'd recognize their features. It'll say, oh, that's the person's name. You met him last week at this conference. And then you won't feel as embarrassed as I normally do when someone comes up to them and says, hi, Peter, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, well, um, yes, I'm, I'm doing well, but who are you again? Um, you dated me at university. Sorry, that was uh, a tough one. So memory procedures, specifically with the Google Glasses, we got that one wrong as well. We don't think it's going to happen in the next time frame. Uh, and then one evening we made some very weird predictions. We said maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to stop someone passing gas and being in an embarrassing situation. You see, um, when you pass gas, there are mainly four main gases. We've got uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and methane, and they're fine. You can't smell them. No one worries about them. It's this bugger, the hydrogen sulfide, which is really problematic. You see, the moment that you emit the hydrogen uh, sulfide, you can't smell it, but the moment it reacts with oxygen, it, it actually gives you that very noxious smell. So if you can stop this gas to merge with and to react with oxygen, you've got it solved. So we thought that maybe in the future there will be a kind of a pad or underpants that you can wear to stop this gas interacting with oxygen. And guess what? We did make this prediction in 2006. By 2012, this company called Shreddies developed such a product which actually has a carbon substrate. It goes for about 500 rand a pair of pants. And this company is ca currently making billions. But nonetheless, they've got this activated carbon cloth, which capture this gas. And it actually means that you can pass gas and no one would even know. On the website, it actually shows you how to stand. Don't stand open legs. Just keep your legs together. And then you pass gas. And then you find no one will even know. Yeah. Um, some other weird ideas, I was uh, invited to give a talk in Australia and in Singapore, and on my way there, I visited the Marina Bay Sands, a beautiful building. They've got this big ship to show the heritage of, of Singapore and what defines their DNA. So I was on top of this building in 2012, and I was taking pictures of this beautiful harbor with 3,000 ships coming into dock and to trade. And as I was taking pictures of this harbor, on my way back to the uh, lift, I saw a number of people taking pictures of the wall. So I'm walking back after taking pictures of the harbor, and here's people taking pictures of the wall. And I'm wondering, why the hell are they taking pictures of the bloody wall? They can take a picture of the harbor, but, but the wall? And then after about three minutes, it dawned on me that they were taking selfies, <laughs> which was quite a shock to my system, because then I realized, as a futurist, my time is over. As a generation Xer trying to determine where the millennials are going, don't even go there. So my track record is checkered. Uh, my mom would have said, oh, yeah, well done, Peter. You predicted fart pants, but you got selfies and self-driving cars all wrong. So with some of these predictions that I will share with you, remember this. Believe nothing you hear and only half of what you see. And with that, let's take a look at what the possible future might look like. So what will the future look like? William Gibson said it quite well. And in my talk, I'm not going to talk about the future that will happen. No one can predict that. We can talk about the future that could happen. What are the technologies that might shape this future? And the question is, what are you, as the leaders of this country, going to do with this knowledge? In essence, that's what we, we ask the challenge. We are asking, knowing that these technologies exist, how can you use them to apply them in the South African and African context? What can you do to create the future? It's a process of co-creation, because no action is automatically focused on a result that you can predict. But based on that dance between the market and the technology, you can use your insight and your wisdom, in essence, to create the future, what the future should be focused on. One of the key insights is not only the technology, but how you change the business model that drives that ecosystem, how you use technology to create a new business model. And that, in essence, is going to be part and parcel of the objectives of this talk. So let's get started. There's a huge number of technologies that will shape our lives. I'm going to touch on only the most important. We believe that in the next 100 years, my apologies, looks like uh, I don't have, unfortunately, audio, so I'm going to skip the audio part on some of them. But in essence, there's a number of the technologies that will have an impact on our near future. We see massive changes in nanotechnology, biotechnology, fintech. We see smart materials playing a major role. The redefining of the linkages between elements in the economy, focusing on shared economy utilization. 
Um, quantum computing, I'll touch briefly on that and how we can make communication far more secure. We've spoken about fintech and a variety of these trends. But within all of those trends, we see three major trends that will have earth-shattering implications for us as a society here on the planet. And the first one we want to take a look at, or the question we want to ask, is will our civilization become a type 1 civilization on the Kardashev scale? Now, what am I talking about? So, Kardashev was an astrophysicist, and he defined various types of civilizations based on the energy we utilize as a civilization. A type 1 civilization, he defined as a civilization that harnesses all of the energy that falls onto the atmosphere of a planet. So if you have a, a, a star close by, what is the energy we can harness from that star being dissipating onto the atmosphere of it? A type 2 civilization would be a civilization that can harness all of the energy of the star. In essence, you're harnessing the energy that is sent into space. So building an ecosystem around it, or a sphere, we call it a Dyson sphere, that we can harness all of that energy and through microwaves we are able to harness that natural energy. A type 3 civilization would be a civilization that would harness multiple solar systems and multiple stars. And we anticipate that we as humans might just become a type 1 civilization in the next 100 years. But that means that we need to look at the way in which we harness energy and create electricity. That's going to be one of the foundational elements. On this scale, where are we? We're a type 0 civilization. We burn things to move around and to support ourselves. And that is one of the key challenges. If we want to sustain ourselves and we want to make sure that we don't have a negative impact on the environment, we need to start looking at alternative solutions in energy utilization. I'm not going to talk about Tubby Star, just for interest sake, for those of you that are interested. Some astrophysicists think that the star called Kepler KRC846-2852 might be surrounded by a Dyson sphere. It's about 1,500 light years away from Earth, and no one knows why the, the light signals from the star is acting like it does. Some people say it might be an alternative civilization. We'll never know. We'll only be able to take a look at the images of the star. Those uh, signals uh, was recorded about eight weeks ago. So go Google Tubby Star. A very interesting debate currently happening uh, on the domain. We believe we might become a type 1 civilization. And the reasons behind it is that we are investing in radical new technologies. Who's heard of ITER? The International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. They're building in France right now. So ITER, a few guys in the audience. And in essence, we are looking at a new way of generating energy. Well, not really new because we're mimicking what's happening on the sun. But instead of taking a look at splitting the atom, we're looking at fusing the atom. In essence, utilizing hydrogen as the basic input, or isotopes of hydrogen, as the basic uh, elements into this tokamak. The problem is you create a plasma under extremely high temperatures, and the plasma can't touch the outside of this container, the tokamak. So you need very high energy, magnetic fields, to contain the plasma. But even if you can only get 0.5% higher energy from it, you can create a self-sustaining reaction, which means we can feed nuclear energy from, and we can, the primary input would be water. So what we are seeing is a revolution in how we approach the world of energy. Now, this is but one of the technologies, the Stellarator at the Max Planck Institute is another example. <coughs> and alternative energy means that we change the way in how we consume it. <coughs> The ex-South African Elon Musk just announced that uh, Powerwall 2, giving you uh, the opportunity to load a battery cell during the day via solar cells and at night utilize that energy. In essence, changing the base load required in each country um, and having a massive impact on it. He also uh, rolled out the new solar cells where the tiles on your roof will now be able to generate energy and utilizing that to take you completely off the grid. In essence, utilizing that energy to drive your vehicle so that you can drive three, four hundred kilometers a day on a vehicle powered by energy derived from the sun. Our friend Bill Gates, um, he believes that the battle for malaria is nearly won through massive DNA changes to the uh, mosquito itself. And this is his new hobby. So 20 of his richest friends got around and they are asking the question, what could we do to change the energy equation on Earth? In essence, making 
electricity literally free? Think of that. If electricity is free, what impact will it have on your electricity bill? What impact will it have on your petrol bill? Think of steel, where 60% of the price of steel can be linked directly to the cost of energy. Take a look at countries and how countries throughout Africa will bloom if the cost of electricity falls to zero. You think that's possible in the next 20 years? Well, as a futurist, we also make mistakes. We see that there's new pa uh, solar panels that can generate energy while it rains. But the most interesting news article wasn't what we anticipate. It's what already happened. If we take a look at the price of photovoltaic cells, the cost in South Africa is about a rand or what. That's approximately what we're looking at. And the price is expected to fall to three American cents, or about 40 cents in rand terms by 2020. So once you buy the solar cells, after that you simply just derive the value from it. But there's something very interesting that happened about two and a half months or three months ago. The guys in Germany created such an efficient self-sustaining energy grid that they were generating too much electricity. And they were worried that the infrastructure might yield under it. So they contacted everyone in Germany and said, listen, please just use electricity. Put on your oven and your air conditioner at the same time. And to entice you to do it, we will pay you to use electricity. This happened three months ago. This is a weak signal. It tells us that in the future, we might go into an ecosystem where energy will literally be free. And in this world of abundance, how will that change things? So how do they purify water in Saudi Arabia and in Dubai? They use, they burn oil, and then they purify water from salt water, desalinated water. Now imagine how this will change the energy equation if electricity is free. We'll get massive solar farms on the coast, desalinating water, and even taking um, normal water and having a far more efficient process in purifying it. What we are seeing is that technology holds the promise of major breakthroughs that will shape the equation of where we're heading in the near future. And very interestingly is that some people are looking at smart materials to store the energy load in the body panels itself. Currently, um, they've got a massive battery inside the car, but what if the car is the battery? So if your daughter comes home and says, Dad, I scratched the battery, you better be worried. It's going to be expensive. Massive changes are happening in cities as well. We're seeing vertical farming in places like Tokyo and um, Korea. These buildings generate their own energy because they've got solar panels at the roof and even their glasses, the, the glass they use in the buildings, the windows, can harness the power of the sun as well. And inside these buildings, about 25% of the surface area is used for vertical farming, hydroponics. And at the bottom, there's koi fish, getting all the nutrients from the plants that they harvest. So you can create a self-sustaining building. If you like herbs and vegetables and fish, uh, you know, cattle is going to be a bit more difficult. So the red meat eaters, you've got a bit of a problem. We might grow that in a lab, but it doesn't taste that good. Uh, but nonetheless, we are seeing a reconfiguration of cities due to the fact that we can make cities green and, ha and harvest vegetables and greens from it. Um, these three gentlemen had a massive impact on the world economy, and most people don't realize it. So Mr. Akasaki, Amono, and Nakamura got the Nobel Prize for the development of the blue lead. Why is that important? Because the blue light spectrum, so the entire light spectrum that you get from a, a bulb like that, the only part of it that really matters for a plant is the blue spectrum and a bit of the red spectrum. And now we can use very little energy to help plants photosynthesize far better. So photosynthesis can now be harnessed by only giving them this weird uh, purple light color that you see. They call it grow lights. And imagine having your own little greenhouse. Wherever you, you can put it, you can, you can actually, sorry about that, I don't have the right slide for that. Oh, I'm getting far ahead of myself. But you can create a greenhouse out of uh, Coca-Cola bottles. And uh, by putting one of these grow lights in it, you can triple the yield of the crops that you put inside these. And, and that means that could be a community-based project that we start tomorrow. So if you have the, the skills, the material is freely available, 
and you can start harvesting your own vegetables in two months from now? That is what technology enables us to do. A second major impact on the world economy is our knowledge of the human brain. There's a massive project underway currently in Europe called the Brain Project. It's an acronym for a very weird, strange word, but in essence we believe that our knowledge of the human brain will, will grow exponentially. One of the questions we're asking is, will we be able to record our dreams in the future? So they utilized the neural network uh, about three years ago at a university in Tokyo, and they connected this to an individual's brain. And then they said, look at the brain patterns and take a look at the video. And now compare the brain patterns and see if you can find a correlation between the patterns that the person perceives and the brain patterns that are emitted. And then they removed the video link and told the computer, here's an individual that looks at a TV, try and determine what this person is looking at. And this was the result. That's the brain patterns on the right-hand side. And this is the visuals that a person is seeing on a TV screen. And take a look at what that computer is predicting. And maybe if we increase the granularity of some of that probes being used, we might just be able to record your dreams. Which means that you have to have a military-grade password because you don't want anyone else to log in on your dream patterns. It's, it's disturbing. The third most important element that will shape our lives is when we become masters of our own evolution, the biotech revolution. In essence, changing our own DNA. And that means that we can analyze the entire strand of DNA, but even better than that, the work that this lady did, Professor Jennifer Doutner, by, and she identified the Cas9 protein that can be used in the CRISPR gene editing system. So technology called CRISPR, this has been used, used for the last 30 years. The Agricultural Research Institute in Pretoria is playing around with it, as is some universities. But the Cas9 protein allows us to edit human, the human genome. What's really interesting is that this individual, Matt Chappelle, did just that about a year ago. He's a homosexual living in San Francisco. He's got HIV and his immune system was severely degraded, and he signed up for this program. And they edited his genes and repairing his immune system. Now, if this gentleman would have had children, those children would have been the first human-designed children with changes to the DNA. And that's what we are seeing. Very soon, we are going to design the next generation of humans that are being born. It's going to open up unbelievable ethical questions, and I don't want to go into that right now, but the technology is there. And it's not planned for the future. It's already here. Massive impact on our lives. There's very weird offshoots to a lot of these technologies, as is a prediction that in the future we're going to use tobacco plants to help us manage cancer. So the images you see there was taken in a lab in Austin, Texas. And this lab is funded by the American military. That's interesting. Why? What they... Uh, developed is the ability to splice a bacteria with a virus and this is then absorbed in the leaves of a tobacco plant and after only four weeks in this tightly controlled temperature controlled ecosystem um, after four weeks you can get 50 doses of the flu vaccine if you compare that with six months that we utilize to cultivate the virus in eggs chicken eggs and we only get half a dose per egg now we can reduce that to four weeks and 50 doses. That means if a serious disease breaks out around the world, you can create an antibody for it and, and harvest it within four weeks. And this is critical. I know the South African government is looking at implementing a solution like that in the Western Cape, where we can then react very quickly on a massive viral outbreak and react on it appropriately. But in the near future, we'll be able to take a virus DNA now, the problem with viruses is that some of the virus strains are completely invisible to the human defense system. So the white blood cells can't react to these cells because it's invisible. But what if we can switch off the stealth mode of those cancer cells? And that's the idea. Extract the cancer cells, deactivate through the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, snip the, the genome, and deactivate the stealth mode. Grow it in your very own tobacco plant. So that's Peter's tobacco plant. 
after four weeks, inject that back into your body. And at this point in time, your white blood cells start recognizing these cancer cells, morph accordingly and attack them. And because they've changed their, uh, their interfaces to interact with those cells, we are going to be seeing uh, opportunity to make cancer a manageable disease, where the white blood cells will start attacking the, the invisible cancer cells as well. So we are entering into a fascinating world where the technology is shaping a variety of industries, and this has a promise of completely changing our future as a, as a civilization on the planet. What impact will this have on jobs? Well, that's always the question I get asked. Thomas Malthus is a good example. Malthus um, came up with a theory in the early 1800s, and he was looking at exponential growth in the, in the population in England. And he said, but hold on. Our resources are only growing in a linear fashion. So our ability to plant food and uh, utilize the basic commodities, that grows in a linear fashion, although the population grows in an exponential fashion. If we take a look at exponential growth over the last 150 years, more people lived in the last century than ever before in mankind's history. So throughout history, we were less than a billion people. Suddenly, after about 1800, we started getting this exponential growth. By 2020, we ex anticipate to have 8 billion people on the planet. And our resources are becoming less and less and less and less. That's a huge, huge problem. Because in the future, we might reach the point where this population might outgrow the resources and our ability to support them with produce, food, water. That is called Malthus's trap. So if we take a look at what happened over the last 150 odd years, we cha we, our population grew from about 1.2 billion people in 1850 to close to about 7 billion people. Uh, I think we, we hit 7 billion by 2012, 2013. What do you think happened to commodity prices in that period? Any guess? So let's say over the last 150 years, it increased 2% year on year or 10% year on year. Do you know what that percentage would be over 150 years? Can anyone guess what happened to the real cost prices of commodities? Inflation adjusted prices. Any guesses? Where our population grew from 1.2 billion to 8 billion. It fell by 80%. Whoa, this doesn't fit in with Malthus's theory at all. Because how the hell did they get that right? We've got a population seven times bigger, but the commodity prices fell by 60%. How is that possible? It's simply called innovation and technology. We don't require copper cables to make telephone calls anymore. Innovation and technology is the driving force that will sustain us as a civilization. And the moment we stop it, we doom ourselves to fall back into Malthus's trap. So innovation and technology is not only something that is hung up on a big label and saying, oh, well, that's, that's something we need to do. It's something we must do in order to sustain ourselves as humans. The interesting thing is that innovation happens in cycles. Kondratiev, very interesting philosopher, he lived, un unfortunately, lived under Stalin. And he speculated that with any major innovation, there is a, a subsequent growth in the economies of capitalist societies. And this is what he saw, that the moment there was an innovation, we had massive growth in those economies. So from the coal revolution, the steam revolution with trains, the internal combustion engine, the electricity revolution, the e electronic revolution, the IT revolution, in each one of these phases, we saw that massive growth. But at the same time, we started seeing creative destruction. The work of Schumpeter focused heavily on that key topic. Because all of the people that, may, that reared cattle and created ossovars, they their jobs disappeared when the internal combustion engine enabled us to drive cars. And technology is now destroying jobs. So in the IT revolution, in the first part, the auto, so the, the spring and the summer, massive benefits. But now we're in the winter and the autumn of the IT revolution, and it is destroying jobs. 
we're looking at robots, we're looking at artificial intelligence, we're looking at machine learning, and all of this is not impacting the low-end workers, it's actually impacting white-collar jobs. I've got, a, I don't know if I might have time, but I've got about 20 slides on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Do you know that close to 30% of articles written in the financial press are now written by computer? There's a, a movie coming out by the end of this year called Morgan from Fox. And it take and it's about an artificially intelligent entity. It normally takes a human or a team of four humans about thirty days to create a thirty second promo cut for that movie. This time around, they asked Watson, the artificial intelligence engine that IBM developed, to create that thirty second intro. And he did it in twenty four hours. What we are seeing is that artificial intelligence will have a huge impact on jobs in the next couple of years, in the winter of the IT revolution. The question is, what does this mean for jobs? We are seeing all of these cycles, and in each period, we are waiting for the next big disruption. So the world of additive printing, um, biotech, nanotech, this can all assist in creating the impetus for drive and growth in new economies, leaving us as a humanity into a new period of growth. The challenge still remains. What about jobs? And I want to leave that debate with a final comment. This actually started way back in uh, the 1920s in uh, Canada, and it was also again utilized in China. I'll use the Chinese example, where they were building the Three Gorges Dam they displaced something close to a million people and at that point in time after the cultural revolution in china they were utilizing manual workforce to build parts of the dam so instead of using earth moving machines they parked them on the side and they gave everyone a shovel and said go and the american diplomat visited this big project and said but why aren't you using the earth moving machines because then you can build the dam you can generate electricity create massive growth out of new industries that will develop from it why are you using people to do something that a machine can do? And the answer from them, the Chinese uh, the diplomat was, we focus on job creation. At which point the American diplomat said, I might not agree with your objectives, but if that is your focus, I've got a suggestion. Take away their shovels and give them teaspoons. You'll create far more jobs. With that, I'll leave that a bit.